Uh, the title of my talk is The Economics of Winning an Election. Um, I've given talks like this about voting and elections in a few different venues. And once I was addressing some students who were not Austrian, and one of the students came up ahead of time and said, um, he's very excited about my talk because he's running for office. <laughs> I told him he might be disappointed <laughs> in what I have to say. And uh, I told him I'm not uh, providing advice. This is not prescriptive. This is uh, attempting to uh, analyze how they win elections, not uh, telling you about the appropriate behavior to win elections. Um, we probably recognize the many quotes by the Austrians um, questioning the moral integrity of elected officials and bureaucrats. We probably don't need to beat this to death, right? So we, we have Murray Rothbard's uh, well-known quote that the state is a gang of thieves writ, writ large. We have Friedrich Hayek's uh, chapter in Road to Serfdom, Why the Worst Get on Top, explaining why the bad people rise in politics. Uh, we have lots of other examples. We have um, a great example in Hoppe, Hans Hoppe's book, uh, democracy, the God that failed. Papa says prime ministers and presidents are selected for their proven efficiency as morally uninhibited demagogues. Thus, democracy virtually assures that only bad and dangerous men will ever rise to the top of government. A wonderful quote. But the question is, why do we elect these men? Why do we, why do we elect bad and dangerous men? What is the mechanics of elections that leads to us uh, 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 voting for these people. In order to win an election, it's important to understand the nature of an election. One way to think about the nature of an election is to compare political democracy to market democracy. And this will illustrate some differences and allow us to think clearly about these issues. Um, so we know, you know, political democracy. You gain power by acquiring enough votes. Um, either a majority or plurality of votes. And uh, for the purposes of today's talk, we're assuming the elections are free and fair, which uh, over the years I've become uh, 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 more skeptical about this claim <laughs> in the US. But we're assuming the votes are counted accurately, people vote once, and they're not coerced in any manner. Of course, if the election's rigged, it doesn't really matter. It's rigged in your favor. It doesn't really matter what you do to win the election. Right? So. All right, but market democracy is quite different. Um, Mises uh, mentions this uh, in multiple places here in socialism. He says, uh, when we call a capitalist society a consumer's democracy, we mean that the power to dispose of the means of production, which belongs to the entrepreneurs and capitalists, so they have the the entrepreneurs have the power, but they're given the power by the consumer votes. They, so this power can only be acquired by means of the consumer's ballot held daily in the marketplace. So the consumer simply votes, you know, he, he buys the red shirt, he's voting for the red shirt. Yeah. And then Mises goes on uh, and says that the consumers by their buying or abstention from buying are as supreme in the market as the citizens through their voting in plebiscites or in the election of officers are supreme in the conduct of the affairs of state. And furthermore, in the market, only the wants and wishes of the majority are taken into account, but not only the wishes of the majority are taken into account, but also those of minorities, provided that they are not entirely insignificant in numbers. So let's spend very few seconds just uh, thinking about market democracy. So, um, you know, I, I go to Target and I get a shopping cart and I put things in the cart, pay for them and I walk out uh, and I voted in this manner. Well, I get to vote as often as I want to. I get to vote frequently. I can buy the red shirt this week and I can buy the blue shirt next week. Um, I get what I vote for. Like if I buy the red shirt, they don't give me a can of peaches when I walk out. I get their red shirt. <laughs> My vote matters. Uh, it sounds odd to say maybe, but uh, I don't vote for things I don't want. You'll see why this is important. So I don't uh, just uh, put things in my cart. And I want half of them and I don't want the ha other half. Um, everybody can vote differently. 
everybody gets to vote. And, you know, no one's really angry. No one sends me an email telling me how to vote, whether to buy the red shirt or the blue shirt. Both parties email me telling me how to vote in, the, in the elections. Um, and I have an incentive to be informed about the items because they make a difference to me, right? So I have an incentive to, especially if I'm going to spend a lot of money, I have an incentive to do some research and, and, uh, and make a good decision here. Uh, things are quite different in, in uh, political democracy. Um, so political democracy is like walking into Target and there's already two shopping carts full of policies and promises. And you're going to walk home with one of those cards, whoever wins the election. Um, um, but, it's, but it's different than market democracy. Um, so you, suppose you want cart A to win the election, and suppose it does win the election. That doesn't mean you get that card. Right? As, soon as, the, as soon as the election is over, the candidate can say, uh, I've changed my mind. I've... Uh, the press can say, uh, CNN can say, they've grown in office whenever, the, whenever they grow in office. Um, hold on to your wallets. Right? So, um, and, uh, but anyway, they don't have to keep their promises. Um, uh, you're allowed to vote. The voting's infrequent. The cart might change. The, the promises and policies that they promise that uh, the candidates in favor of might change. Everybody gets the same cart. This is the source of one of the main sources of all the conflict in politics is we all end up with the same um, elected officials. Uh, you vote, oddly enough, one of the inefficiencies of voting is you vote for things you really don't want. So you support cart A because it's maybe the lesser of two evils, but that candidate probably says things you don't agree with, but you vote for him anyway, and right? you prefer a candidate. And it's a bundled choice, so you can't unbundle it like you can uh, in market democracy. Um, uh, your vote doesn't matter. If you vote for cart A, you get cart A. If you vote for cart B, you get cart A. <laughs> if, you vote for, if you vote for minor cart C, you get cart A. If you don't vote, you get cart A. <laughs> it's, it's quite different here. Um, and of course, since your vote doesn't matter, you have little incentive to be informed. At least regarding voting, you have little incentive to be informed. That doesn't mean we should have uninformed citizens, because uninformed citizens might change the way the promises the, poli the candidates make. So there's a the reason to have informed citizens. It's just being informed doesn't really help you as far as voting, because your vote doesn't matter. So regarding voting, you don't have an incentive to be informed. You might have an incentive for other reasons. All right, so there's a lot of issues here. Um, uh, let's, uh, we, we only have a few minutes, so uh, let's consider two main issues. So you're the candidate, and you're making a series of promises and, po and you know, policies you support and promises you're making to the, to the voters. And uh, so you're thinking to yourself, what, sh what should I promise? What's this bundle of promises that I should make? What should, what, what should be contained in the bundle? And, and remember, you can change the bundle immediately if you win the election. So you're just thinking, how do I win the election? And then uh, another issue is, uh, how do you get, what do you tell your supporters in order to get them to show up and vote in spite of the fact their vote doesn't matter? And a lot of voters, I think, realize their vote doesn't matter. I, I know people who vote and realize their vote really doesn't affect the outcome of the election. All right. So how should we think about this? Uh, uh, which bundle will attract a majority of voters? Um, let's, uh, let's think about a spectrum of voters from the far left to the far right. I know it's much more complicated. It should be multidimensional. But just consider a spectrum of voters. And generally, there's not a lot of voters on the extremes. And there's a bundle of voters. No, I shouldn't have said a bundle. There's a different bundle here. And there's a block of voters somewhere in the middle. And isn't that the set of voters you want to attract? So in, in uh, public choice theory, uh, they say uh, there's the median voter theorem. It says if you attract the median voter, you win the election. And I mean, this, this theorem suffers from uh, false precision. Uh, you're not really trying. 
trying to attract the exact median voter. But there is a block of voters somewhere. I mean, you don't want to be painted as an extremist. I mean, both candidates are going to paint the other guys uh, as an extremist, that he's not, you know, more or less in the middle of the spectrum. So I think there's something to say. I think there's uh, some uh, truth in this median voter uh, theorem idea. So one implication of this median voter theorem is that candidates often agree on things, which you might think is not the case this year, but uh, uh, it might be less so this year. But um, I think it was the I better not say, I think it was the 2012 election. One of the news sources after one of the debates listed all the things the candidates agree on. And they were just surprised the candidates agree on so much. But even this year, they're going to, I mean, both candidates are going to support a massive amount of military spending, maybe a trillion dollars a year. They're both going to say entitlements such as Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid are off the table budget-wise. They're sacrosanct and cannot be touched. They're both going to be in favor of easy monetary policy. Regardless of who's running this year, that's, they, would, they would have been in favor of these things. They're, they're both going to be in favor of easy monetary policy, especially in the face of high unemployment. They're going, they're both would be in favor of uh, massive stimulus packages in, in, uh, to, to fight recessions. Um, uh, whoever wins the election, I suspect, would be in, is not going to pay a lot of attention to the debt because voters really don't want them to. Right? So... So even, even this year, I think there's a, a list of things that, uh, that, uh, that uh, candidates might agree on because they're really trying to attract some of the same voters. There is one issue here for the candidates, and that is that if you have to win the primary and then the general election, then there's kind of a problem here because there's a different median voter in the primary and in the general election. So you have to plan this out ahead of time or you have your campaign manager do it. So when you make these promises and statements in the primary, you know you're gonna flip-flop and change your mind and attract a different median voter. So you wanna give yourself uh, plausible deniability. You wanna say, I didn't say that. When, you're, when your opponent puts up the YouTube videos of you saying one thing and saying something different three months later, you wanna deny it, I was misquoted or something. I'm a straight talker, my bus says straight talker. <laughs> One of the candidates uh, 12 years ago, I think, or, or straight talk, maybe. I would never change my life. Now, of course, you always want to accuse the other guy of flip-flopping, right? And he probably has. <laughs> probably have a point there. <laughs> All right. So what, what appeals to the median voter? Well, just think of it in terms of costs and benefits, right? So we don't elect these people just because we enjoy voting for morally corrupt people. We can probably say there's other reasons we elect morally corrupt people. Right? So if we just think of it in terms of costs and benefits to the voters, then things kind of fall into place. Uh, so, so what do voters want? Uh, well, they want benefits for supporting you. What do they want? Other people's money. This is what people want, right? So uh, the key is to provide these concentrated benefits to special interests. Right? So, so you get the elderly, you get the retirees to vote for you by saying Social Security is off the table budget-wise. You get the farmers to vote for you by saying you support price supports and higher food prices. Uh, you get the steel industry to support you by saying you're protecting them from foreign competition. And then you give them these concentrated benefits. And of course, both candidates, they do, all candidates do this, all the major candidates. One way to do this is just through direct transfer payments where the government takes some people's money on this side of the aisle and gives, it, gives bags of cash to you guys. And uh, this is, budget-wise, this is mainly what the federal government does. So for the 2020 Economic Report of the President, it says uh, federal purchases were $1,295 billion, $1.3 trillion. But spending was 4.4 trillion, overall spending. But they only spent 1.3 trillion actually buying anything. The rest of it, they were just shifting dollars around from one group to another. So 71% of uh, federal spending was, uh, there were no purchases involved. There were no goods and services being produced. Um, this last statement says, uh, I think they're lying to you about spending. So. I'll return to this in a moment. 
But if you look at the daily treasury statements, it says withdrawals for all, from all government accounts in two, fiscal year 2019 were almost 16 trillion. And shouldn't all withdrawals be called spending? Yes, they should. <laughs> they don't count debt payments as spending. I'll return to this in a moment. <laughs> All right, you can also transfer wealth just through uh, uh, regulatory transfers. So uh, 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 price floors on uh, soybeans transfer wealth from people who eat food that contains soybeans, who pay higher prices for this food, transfers the wealth to soybean growers. Um, uh, uh, trade restrictions, I'll talk about this on Friday. Transfer wealth, again, if you protect the steel industry, you're transferring wealth uh, away from consumers who buy products uh, made of uh, domestic steel to the steel industry in the U.S. So you can do a tremendous amount of wealth transfers just through uh, regulatory transfers. And another way to transfer wealth is, uh, I think, through the debt. So um, uh, I realize there's a resource issue here, but in some sense, uh, there's a wealth transfer going on with the debt. So when I put up the debt numbers historically to my, to my uh, classes, Sometimes I'll tell them, um, look what's happened the last 20 years. The baby boomers have uh, had the government borrow lots of money, providing us with lots of benefits and promises, promising us even more benefits in the future, and you get to pay for it. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I thank them. I say, thank you for doing this, and uh, thank you for your support. And some of them are um, irritated by this. And I tell them, uh, that's the way, that's, so that's, that's democracy. That's democracy at work. <laughs> so, <laughs> you get to vote yourself other people's wealth. All right, the downside of doing this, of course, is that you're, you are um, taking away some people's wealth. <laughs> so the key here uh, is to uh, uh, take away their wealth without them being too angry at you. So, all right. The, the, uh, one thing that uh, they talk about quite a bit, people who write about these things, is that you should dis disperse the costs. So you want to make everybody that buys products with softwood, they're made of softwood lumber, pay slightly higher prices because we keep the price of softwood lumber in the U.S. above the price it otherwise would be if we allowed the free exchange of softwood lumber from Canada. Right. So everybody pays higher prices, but Everybody pays a little bit higher prices. You, know, you disperse the cost. No one's too angry about it, and most of them don't know about it at all. So, and that's the second key. You want to hide the costs as much as possible. So you don't want to go around telling people during the campaign, yes, you pay higher food prices. Yes, you pay higher prices for products made of softwood lumber. Yes, you pay higher prices for products made of steel. You, you, you want to... Uh, 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 not make this apparent. And I'll return to uh, one issue that I think I'm the only person uh, concerned about this issue, but uh, but I, I get to say it. So, <laughs> so, all right. So within the daily treasury statements for two, fiscal year 2019, they have a line in the in the accounting statement called public debt cash redemptions, 10,959 billion, 11 trillion dollars. They don't count this as spending, by the way. When they tell you that spending is 4.4 trillion. So what is this? Uh, debt redemptions. This is the money they're, they're spending paying off, making the debt payments. So they're borrowing $11 trillion last year because they're rolling over the debt so fast. So they, they borrow 11 trillion, pay off 11 trillion of debt, and they say, that's not spending. But I think they're hiding it from us. I think some people would be angry to know that uh, this is occurring. And I think it's very dangerous. I mean, it's, uh, our government needs to borrow over $11 trillion this year just to maintain their budget. They need to borrow $11 trillion plus pay for the deficit. They're going to borrow more than $12 trillion. But, but they just don't tell us about that. They say, it's not spending. <laughs> Of course, no household or business doesn't count their debt payments as, and say, well, that's not spending. If you pay off your student loans, are you saying, well, that's not spending? That's not part of my budget. I didn't 
Well, of course you spent the money. Right? So. All right, here's another way they hide things from us. Every agency of the federal government is required to turn in a financial audit every fiscal year. So the fiscal year ends uh, September 30th. They have six months to turn in the audit at, to April 1st, and then uh, they put the uh, various statements together, and it's called the Consolidated Financial Statement. And I've been watching this uh, happen since the 1990s. Uh, a lot of times an agency just doesn't turn in anything. And sometimes Congress gives them more money for accountants when they do this. Right? So, and then uh, most of the time, uh, the statements they turn in do not meet minimal accounting standards, and they're unreadable. And um, so the state, and then every year the, the GAO puts out a statement saying uh, it's a mess, basically. So uh, here's part of their statement uh, this year. This year, they put out the statement regarding the 2019 consolidated financial statement. And the GAO said, we audit the financial statements in, the re in that report each year, but we haven't yet been able to determine if the statements fairly present the government's finances. <laughs> this year, it was due in part to serious financial management problems at uh, Department of Defense, inadequate accounting for balances between federal agencies, and weaknesses in the process for preparing statements. <laughs> and that's the big one, right? They, we, their statements are generally unreadable. Right? And every year the GAO complains about it, but they never, I mean, they just, if the agency says they need more money, they just give them more money for your accounting. And so it's, it, it never ends. I kind of got off track there for a couple of slides, but the point is uh, uh, hiding things from us is an effective political tactic. All right, so now you've um, provided your supporters with benefits through wealth transfers. Hopefully they'll support you for that. But you also want to, to tell them there's a huge cost if you lose the election. Now, you, do you want to provide them with sober analysis regarding the other candidates' policies in doing this? <laughs> I say no. <laughs> Fear. Fear is the key. Fear trumps logic. Make the voters fear the other candidate. Um, in one of the elections, uh, not the 2016 election, one of the elections before then, um, one of the news sources, I think it was CNN, they, they went to a political rally for one of the candidates, and then they interviewed the supporters, and they put together the clips of how the supporters were scared to death of the other candidate. And then they went to the other candidates' rally and did the same thing. <laughs> and then they interviewed supporters, and the supporters were just terribly fearful of what would happen to the country if the other candidate won. So that's what you want to do. You want to, you want to, you want to tell people uh, how fearful they should be if the other candidate uh, wins the election. And of course, you could write the campaign speeches years in advance here. Right? If I'm not elected, you might die from a terrorist attack or, or a virus. Uh, if I'm not elected, your taxes will be raised. That's, that's likely a true statement. If I'm not elected, you may lose your job. Your children won't get a good education. You may not get health care. The environment will be destroyed, and we will run out of energy. <laughs> Even though on a lot of these things, the candidates really agree on a lot, a lot of these issues. Um, but anyway, this, uh, this works. All right, so what's the first lesson here? If you're morally opposed to taking away people's property, maybe politics is not your, shouldn't be your preferred career. <laughs> I mean, you're at a political disadvantage. If you're, if you're morally opposed to it, you either have to live with this uh, uh, moral dissonance while you're doing it, or you just have to not do it and not get elected, right? So, uh, um, all right. But suppose you're not morally opposed to it. You're willing to, to engage in this to try to get elected. So now you've, you've made a bunch of promises and, policy and, and uh, uh, supported policies that you think will uh, generate political support. The next question is, how do you get voters to show up and vote? So let's spend a minute on your vote doesn't matter issue, just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, 
So when could your vote matter? Well, if there's an even number of voters, say 10, by the way, there's no recounts here. So uh, when there's recounts, it came out after the 2000 election, recounts mean your vote matters less. So uh, in spite of what the commentators said at the time, that uh, Florida proves your vote matters, right? Statistically speaking, recounts mean your, uh, your vote matters less. But suppose there's no recounts. So if there's 10 voters, the only time your vote might matter is if, is if you create a tie. So if you don't vote, your candidate loses by one vote. He has 0% chance of winning the election. But because you voted, it's a tie. So you've increased his odds to 50%. I mean, he still might lose, right? So. And then if, you, uh, if there's an odd number of voters, uh, you know, if there's 11 voters, the only time your vote matters is if it uh, breaks a tie. And then it might not matter anyway. You didn't vote, there was a tie, your candidate might have won anyway, depending on how they break ties. Right? So there might have been a 50% chance of your candidate winning, you voted, he won. So there's a lot of statistical analysis on this. Roughly, this is very rough, roughly speaking, according to the literature I've read, uh, your, the odds of affecting an election with your vote are one over N, where N is the number of voters. So let's, uh, 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 let's just say there's 100 million voters. There's going to be more this fall. But, so your odds are roughly one in 100 million of determining who the president is. Uh, I realize there's an electoral college and everything. Um, but there's other factors involved in whether or not your votes matters. There's many other factors. So generally, they say you could move the decimal point one either direction. So. For 100 million, maybe your vote matters uh, one in 10 million times. If you voted in every election for 40 million years, your vote might matter once. I don't know. <laughs> right. But if you're in Washington, DC, it's your, your chance of uh, affecting election is something like one in four and a half billion, because they all vote for the same party, and they have one electoral vote. So it depends on which state you're in. All right, I, I'm, I teach in Michigan. My students love this next uh, statement. So uh, I tell them their vote doesn't matter. And I've looked at every election since 1900, and, and uh, this, this article's out there somewhere. And um, uh, some states, since 1900, their votes, the whole state has never mattered in any election. <laughs> Michigan is one of those states. If every voter in Michigan had voted for the loser for the last 120 years, the winner still would have won the election. <laughs> not only does, I tell my students, not only does your vote not matter, Michigan's votes don't matter. Right? Sometimes a whole state matters, let's, but not Michigan. Right? So, all right. So we're fond of saying things like, uh, you're more likely to get hit by lightning than have your vote matter. or you're more likely to die driving to the polls in a car wreck than having your vote determine who the president is. There's a wonderful article, 2008, Journal of American Medical Association, looking at the Tuesdays, the four Tuesdays before and after the election and pointing out the odds of dying driving on election day. And they argue that there's a 28% spike in deaths on the highways on election day. So even if there wasn't the spike, the odds of, you know, have the greater odds of uh, dying while driving on election day than affecting who the president is. But the Journal of American Medical Association uh, has looked at the data on this. The article at the end says you should vote anyway, but, it's, but that's, of course they do. So. All right. So now, um, how, what, do, what do candidates say to get uh, voters to show up in spite, of their vote, in spite of the fact their vote doesn't matter? Tell them their vote matters. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, haven't you seen candidates? Of course you've seen candidates do this, haven't you? I've seen candidates say your vote, you know, Ohio matters, therefore your vote matters. Right? So, uh, I get emails from both parties. One of them told me, uh, the outcome hinges on your vote. No, it doesn't. 
the outcome does not hinge on my vote. <laughs> Are they, I've already heard this a lot this year. Uh, this is the most important election ever. Every election is the most important election ever. That's a, but that doesn't, even if it is the most important election, that doesn't imply that you should vote. I mean, suppose it is the most important election. My vote doesn't matter, so why? It's a, just a logical leap from it's the most important election ever, therefore you should vote. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and, and the frequent, uh, uh, if you don't vote, you can't complain. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the faculty at Ferris State University where I'm at have a political engagement project and uh, we hand out flyers telling them to vote and all of these fallacies are on the flyers. <laughs> If you don't vote, you can't complain. There's no statement more false. I mean, there are false statements. There's nothing more false than this statement, right? This is, you know, if I say I'm 12 foot tall, that's false. It's not more false than if you, if you don't vote, you can't complain, right? You can complain. You know, I made a career out of complaining, so. <laughs> of course you can complain. No one's ever said, did you vote? <laughs> you know. All right, but maybe they mean uh, if you don't vote, you have no moral right to complain. Is that what it means? There's an ethical issue here. So maybe there's two classes of people, the voters and the non-voters, and only the voters have the right to complain. But isn't, if we're gonna do this class analysis, I think everybody has a right to complain. But if we're gonna do this class analysis, isn't it the voters that shouldn't complain? It's their fault. <laughs> I mean, we should blame these people. The, the non-voters are not at fault. It seems like they have a greater right to complain than, than uh, the voters. Uh, they often point out a lot of votes make a difference. So when I say your vote doesn't matter, a lot, a lot of times people will say, well, what if a lot of people believe that? Wouldn't that matter? Yeah, but the, the fact that a lot of votes might matter doesn't imply your vote matters. This is a basic fallacy in logic, in first semester logic, right? It's the fallacy of division. I mean, voters don't know logic, but uh, <laughs> you might be able to squeeze this by them. But uh, all right, what else do they do? Um, they, they always talk in terms of we. We need to win the election, like we're a team. So this is why they... One party kept asking me for $3. They must have asked me like 50 times to give them $3. And my $3 doesn't matter, but if I give them $3, I'm on the team. Right? So I'm more likely to vote because I've given money. So, so uh, my analogy is with uh, like uh, attending a football game and there's 80,000 people at the stadium here at Auburn cheering on the team. I've been in those crowds. And uh, we're yelling to disrupt the opposing uh, quarterback. And I know my vote doesn't matter. I know my yelling doesn't affect the decibel level, but I yell anyway, don't you? Because you're on the team, you're supporting the team. Well, that's like voting. <laughs> so <laughs> so they, they try to, to, to say, uh, you know, talk in terms of pronouns like we. Uh, they say it's a civic duty. I don't have time to attack this one. But uh, you know, not voting is one of the uh, uh, sins. You know, democracy as a civic religion. There are certain sins as far as not saying the national anthem, not standing, uh, not saying the pledge of allegiance, not standing for the national anthem, not voting. So it's a moral imperative. I don't have time to say what I think about this one. So uh, you should be proud to vote. You get to wear the sticker. You walk, or at least do they wear, where I'm at, everybody wears the stickers. I voted. Um, I, and, uh, and I wear the, I have a sticker with the American flag. It says, I did not vote. <laughs> uh, one, one election day, I was at the library, and the librarian commended me about what a wonderful human being I am because I voted. <laughs> and I said, it actually says, I did not vote. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, she was very disappointed and uh, treated me like a you know, subhuman or something. <laughs> uh, I've got to say one more thing. I might run out of time, but once I was wearing this sticker, it makes people at my school angry, the sticker does. So, so one guy approached me in the hall and showed me how disappointed he was 
of my I did not vote sticker. And I was just trying to joke around. I didn't want to argue with the guy. And I told him, uh, I support our highest goal, diversity. Shouldn't we have a diverse faculty? Some vote and some don't vote? Because <laughs> <laughs> diversity trumps democracy. So, <laughs> All right, you might think that these are silly statements, but the voters have been in public schools forever, and they, they hear these things you know, in the... In the in high school, in junior high, in colleges. We tell them that at my school. <laughs> and uh, so when the candidate says these things, you might think, uh, well, my ninth grade teacher said it, and she was a nice lady. It's probably true, right? So maybe I should vote. So anyway, it's reinforced th throughout the government school system. All right. Um, so it looks here like the candidates have an opportunity in what I've been saying today. The opportunity is to be deceptive. It doesn't, it doesn't look like I've been saying, uh, if you want to win the election, uh, opportunities arise for you to uh, uh, not blurt out the truth, at least. Certainly, you don't want to go around as a candidate just blurting out the truth. Your vote doesn't matter. Of course, I'm catering to special interests. Of course, I flip-flopped, changed my mind to attract different voters. And of course, my message changes from state to state. And, uh, you know, you want to deny all of that. And, uh, but I've, for instance, I've said things today. Uh, you get to promise one bundle of policies and promises, and then you can immediately, you don't have to deliver on it. There's, we don't have to uh, 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 beat this to death, right? This is an obvious point, I think. Um, um, in the uh, 2008 election, uh, Obama kept attacking uh, Bush on the deficit and saying he was going to get this under control, and, and I, you know, I never believed him. I didn't think he had any inclination to try to balance the budget or anything. Right? But, but it was, you don't have to deliver on what you're going to say. I'm not trying to single out Obama. I mean, I, it's just, uh, for my students, the Democrats think I'm talking about Republicans, and the Republicans think I'm talking about Democrats here. <laughs> That's not the case. Right? So, uh, you know, you want to cater to special interests, and have policies with concentrated benefits. These are usually destructive policies, but of course you want to say it strengthens America or something, right? talk in some cliche or platitude about uh, 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 made in America or make America great or something. Uh, and then you might flip-flop from the primary to the general election, and you might tell all sorts of uh, deceptions regarding voting, like your vote doesn't matter. So, so, so uh, what about this deceptiveness? I mean, won't we realize the candidates are deceptive? We might not care. A lot of voters, if it's your candidate, do you really care if he's deceptive? Not so much. You know, you're, you're more worried about the other guy being deceptive and lying. But uh, you're more likely to get away with being deceptive uh, in, the, in the political sector than the private sector. So if I'm selling you a product in the private sector and I tell you that uh, if you buy my product, um, all your dreams will come true, and you buy, your, you buy my product and all your dreams don't come true, and you realize, well, that's not a truthful statement. <laughs> so in the political sector, you tend to get away with it. And the reason you can tend to get away with it is, uh, you know, uh, voters are ignorant. Voters are rationally ignorant. It's rational for, most, for many, many voters to not pay attention to politics because the costs are too high and the benefits are low because their vote doesn't matter. Right? Uh, you, it's uh, pretty difficult to win elections appealing to informed voters because there's just not enough of them. You have to appeal to, un, to uninformed voters, to, to ignorant voters, at least ignorant about political issues. And one reason they're igno ignorant, um, I say ignorant because that's the phrase we use in economics. It's kind of a, a brutal f phrase, I think, but uh, is that they, they don't want us to know what they're doing, as I pointed out earlier. Um, but but uh, let me 
talk about a couple of uh, other stories here about uh, uh, rationally ignorant voters. Um, and I haven't seen the numbers for a few years. I've looked for them, but uh, at one time there was a, a they had put the uh, State of the Union speeches in one of those uh, programs that determine the comprehension level. And like around 1980, it was about a 10th or 11th grade level or something. And they said, well, the president is speaking to a, a congressman. And if you want to talk to congressmen, you need to talk to them like they're in high school or 11th or 12th grade or something. But then by 2013, the comprehension level was eighth grade because the president's talking to voters now when he gives the State of the Union a speech. If you want to talk to voters, you need to talk to them at about a comprehension level of about eighth grade because, you know, you want to say, uh, 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 make America strong and jobs and it's, it's for the children. Anything that's for the children, the voters will throw money at you for the children. So that's... Um, um, uh, one other story, uh, you may have seen this, although it was years ago, I think it was 2011. Um, it, was a, it was a political rally, and um, I think it was in Washington, D.C., and they put up a sign that said, Obama equals Keynesian, and they just turned on the cameras. Right? And uh, people would walk by and just scream at them, and they would say, uh, Obama's not Keynesian. He was born in the U.S. <laughs> he, he showed you his birth certificate. You people are crazy. And the guy with the microphone would say, well, that proves he's not Keynesian. Yes, it does. You saw his birth certificate. Yeah, and they would just lose their own. But of course, do you expect voters to know that they're Keynesian? I mean... <laughs> I have students that take macro and they still don't know what Keynesian is at the end. <laughs> so uh, um, anyway, you know, I, I don't expect voters to, to uh, uh, know this. All right, it looks like we have a second lesson. Uh, candidates that are averse to being <laughs> deceptive or is a, at a political disadvantage. If, again, if you insist on walking around um, blurting out the truth, <laughs> and uh, refusing to take away people's money, I recommend the private sector for you. <laughs> all right, uh, so in conclusion, I'll cite an authority on all of this, myself. Uh, Therefore, candidates who are willing to violate property rights, to steal and be deceptive, have an advantage over candidates with stronger moral convic convictions. So of course elected officials are corrupt. Candidates with moral integrity are at a severe disadvantage in the political sphere. Thank you. <laughs>